Mike Radich here, and I'm now joined on the phone by author Mike Chapman. Mike, how are you? I'm doing good, Mike. It's a beautiful day here in Iowa, right in the middle of the Midwest, and I'm just happy to be on the phone with you. Mike, today we're going to be talking about the life and career of actor Tom Tyler. But before we talk about him, let's start with you. In 2005, you wrote a book about Tom called The Tom Tyler Story, From Cowboy Star to Superhero. Now, you're a true Renaissance man. In the past, you've written books on many different subjects. You're a motivational speaker. You're a wrestling historian. You're the founder of the Dan Hodge Trophy, which is the Heisman Trophy of college wrestling. And you do so much more beyond what I've said. So I'm just curious, why write a book about Tom Tyler? That's a great question, Mike. I've written 29 books. I retired from a 35-year newspaper career in 2002. I was publisher of the local newspaper here in Newton, Iowa. And I also created the International Wrestling Institute and Museum here mm-hmm. in Newton. Uh, the great Lou Fez, Vern Gagne, Dan Hodge, who you just mentioned. It honors both amateur wrestlers like Dan Gable, one of my close friends for 40 years, and professional wrestling. So I grew up in Waterloo, Iowa, and the culture there was wrestling, 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 amateur and pro. So I wrestled uh, all through high school, and I wrestled three years in the Navy. I've competed in wrestling, judo, and sambo, which is submission wrestling. But my, my real true love, even more, I think, than wrestling, Mike, has been weightlifting. I started weightlifting when I was 15 years old, back in the late 50s, and hardly anybody was lifting weights back then. Coaches would say, weightlifting will make you muscle-bound and slow, and of course mm-hmm. we all know that's a fallacy now. Even golfers and women athletes lift weights. So I was into weights very early. I used to compete in bench press contests. I once bench 440 at a body weight of 205. And there was something when I saw Tom Tyler on the screen uh, on a flickering black and white TV set in the 50s. They were playing some old Western movies. I was taken by his presence, just the way he looked, the way he moved, everything about him. And then, Mike, when I found out that he was a national weightlifting champion at the same time he was in Hollywood cranking out these B-movies, I was hooked. And I became a big fan of Tom Tyler. The more I researched him, and there's scant information about him out there, as you well know. And uh, oh, about uh, 2003, 2004, I was having a lull in my writing of wrestling and other things. And I said, somebody needs to write a biography of Tom Tyler. He was the Arnold Schwarzenegger of his era uh, in some regards, because he was the strongest man in Hollywood and the best built man in Hollywood. And he had this very interesting, intriguing career. And then, Mike, to top it all off, my all-time favorite superhero with superpowers is Captain Marvel. And only second only to Tarzan among normal superheroes, that is people who don't have superpowers but are just tremendously strong, is the Phantom. So tie it all in, Mike. He had that great presence as a Western star. He played the Phantom. He played Captain Marvel, two of my all-time favorites, and he's a national weightlifting champion. And I just wanted to tell his story. I was a little late to the party because I'm only 23, so I didn't discover Tom Tyler until the late 90s. But when did you first become aware of him? Well, I've searched my memory bank for that information, too. And it's, I, I can't come up with a concrete time or date or movie. I did like Bob Steele. Uh, I just liked his scrappiness. My all-time favorite Western star is Tom Mix. But Tom Tyler is second on my list. And then when I saw that he was in, I, probably the first time I saw Tom Tyler in a movie on the black and white small TV set in my parents' house, I would guess was a Three Musketeers film because I do remember Bob Steele and Tom Tyler interacting together. And that also was, was an attraction to me because, again, I do like Bob Steele. And I'm sitting here right now, Mike, as we are talking, looking at this huge poster, Outlaws of the Cherokee Trail, it's got Tom Tyler in the upper left-hand corner. Then it's got Ruff Davis with his mouth wide open 
like he's frightened. And in the bottom right-hand corner is Bob Steele with his pistol drawn. And it's just a magnificent poster. So I see that every day when I come down in my den to write. I have Tarzan posters all over, too. Uh, but I see that that poster is right in front of me as I walk into my den every single day. How much did you know about Tom before writing your book? Not very much. To repeat myself, I knew that he was a Western star, that he'd played Captain Marvel in the Phantom, and he was a national weightlifting champion. And again, I'm a devout weightlifter. I'm 73, and uh, yet later this afternoon, I'll be in the Newton YMCA lifting weights. I've lifted weights for 55 years, uh, and I love to lift weights. And so that created a bond between Tom Tyler and me, the same way I feel about Steve Reeves, who played Hercules in the 50s. And I used to sit in a movie theater in Waterloo and stare up at the screen and be amazed at the physique of Steve Reeves. Well, if people will look at the pictures I found of Tom Tyler in my book, they'll see that his physique rivals that of Steve Reeves. And I've even made the case that if the Mr. America contest would have been around in Tom's heyday in the mid-20s, Tom probably would have won the title of Mr. America. That's how well built he was. So uh, my first impressions of him were just as a cowboy star. And then I went to a movie theater once when they recycled Captain Marvel, probably in the late 50s. And I still think it's one of the neatest serials ever made. David Sharp did a mm -hmm. great job, as you know, as a stuntman. Mm -hmm. And Tom Tyler looked great in the uniform. So my information was pretty, pretty scant. But I did. Uh, I spent about a year off and on in research to find out more about the real Tom Tyler. When you were doing your research for this book, what surprised you the most about his life? I guess his work ethic, that keeps shining through. Tom was not afraid of hard work. There's a quote by David Sharp uh, in the book that I found in the Hollywood library that I went to. He said, Tom Tyler is a real hero. He said he was strapped into that flying machine. He was hoisted up for hours. He said that had to be very, very painful, and yet Tom never complained or said a word. Mike, even though you've written the definitive book about Tom Tyler, I still see people on the Internet who aren't on the same page with you. Some of what I see is because they believe the incorrect information about him that anyone can find on the internet, and the other half of it is because for a very long time, very little was known about him, so people don't know what to believe. So what would you say is the biggest misconception about Tom? Well, that, that's an interesting premise you're tossing at me, Mike. I wasn't aware of that. Uh, first of all, let me give a disclaimer. I'm not really a Western film authority. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's people out there who know a lot more about the history of Western films than me. However, Bobby Copeland, the late, great Bobby Copeland, mm -hmm. found out I was writing the book, and he emailed me and said, if there's any way I can help you, let me know. And I did know who Bobby was, although I didn't have the depth of knowledge about his uh, writing background. And we talked over the phone several times, and I thought, wow, I really need Bobby's help here. So he did read the entire manuscript. He made suggestions. Uh, he provided some background. I would say the biggest misconception about him is what caused his death. Uh, I still hear and read from time to time that it was arthritis, and it wasn't. It was a disease called scleroderma. It's a, it's a terrible disease. I did a lot of research on it. And something else I did, Mike, was because of my journalism background, I actually called up his nephew, Ray Flepsky, up in Detroit, got on the phone with him, talked to him for quite a bit, and then I just finally said, hey, Ray, can I pop in the car and drive up there and sit down with you and talk? And he said, absolutely. So I drove up there. Ray Slepsky was his was Tom's sister's son. Tom was his godfather. That's the home Tom Tyler went to the last year of his life from Hollywood when he was completely crippled up by arthritis. Ray remembers him. Actually, Ray gave up his bedroom to Uncle Tom and moved to another room down the hallway. And he remembers in quite vivid detail the pain and the agony that Tom was going through in the last year of his life. 
I've actually sat in that house where Tom Tyler passed away and talked to Ray Slepsky and his wife and several other family members about Tom Tyler. And then he told me about his cousin, Mike Tyler, out in Apple Valley, California, who's a retired police detective, who was the son of Tom Tyler's brother, Frank Jr. And I called up him, and I drove all the way out to California. I don't fly much, I drive. Went to California and spent uh, a day and a half interviewing him. And then I went into Hollywood and went to the magnificent Margaret Herrick Library there and went up into the room. You have to sign in and you're checked out and asked to see the Tom Tyler file. And they make you wear white gloves and they bring the file information out. And I went through every single piece of writing there in that thick file. So I did a lot of research. I spent a lot of money and a lot of time to try to ferret out the facts of Tom's life. And and I'm not the kind of biographer, Mike, who thinks I have to have every last detail, that I have to know uh, every single aspect of his life. It's a short book. It's 144 pages, but I think it provides a very good overview into the kind of person he was and the kind of life he lived and uh, the tragedy of his death. So I'm, I'm pleased with the book. Now let's dive into Tom's life. His real name is Vincent Markowski. Who came up with the name Tom Tyler, and why that name? Good question, and I think the answer is uh, unknowable. In my book, I say that they didn't like the name Vincent Markowski. When he signed with FBO, they said, you've got to have a more marketable name. Tom, where that came from, is anybody's guess, but I say in the book, Tom Mix would be a good a good starting point. I do know he admired Tom Mix, and uh, the version that one of his nephews told me is that he had said he just started thumbing through a phone book one day and came to the name Tyler and liked it and thought Tom Tyler had a nice phonetic feel to it, sound to it, and uh, it actually happened that quickly. And that's kind of what Herman Bricks told me about his name when he changed his name from Herman Bricks to Bruce Bennett mm-hmm. after he made the two Tarzan movies and was typecast. He said he only spent about 20 minutes uh, thinking. He, <laughs> he always liked the name Bruce, and uh, somebody mentioned the name. It went. I think his wife, Jeanette, said, well, Bennett would go nice with that. She knew somebody named Bennett, and he pondered it for about an hour, and all of a sudden Herman Bricks became Bruce Bennett. So a lot of it has to do with phonetics and just what lingers in the back of somebody's mind. If Vincent Markowski was a Tom Mix fan, which I have heard he was, it'd be natural that he would gravitate toward the name Tom. And then Tyler, just, it just I, I think it has a nice ring to it, don't you? Oh, a great ring to it. I love it. It's a great name. It really is the perfect name for a leading man. Now, off camera, what kind of guy was he? When you read about people who worked with him, from the director, Whitney, to Oliver Drake, the screenwriter, everybody just says what a nice guy he was. And that appealed to me, too, Mike. If I'd been started to do the research and I found out he was arrogant and selfish and uh, prideful and not a very nice person, I wouldn't have written the book. I would have lost interest in it. Everybody liked him. He was modest. He was shy. And I'm also looking at a picture of him right here that you've probably never seen. It's a studio pose of him from the mid-20s, and he's got his face tilted to the site, and he's got a great big smile on. And his nephew, Mike Tyler, the, who was at, lived in Apple Valley that I just referred to, had several of those, and he said they're very rare, those photos, and that Tom had actually given them to him personally. And as we were leaving, he said, would you like one? And I said, oh, I'd love one. So, And then he made a photocopy of a contract Tom had signed, and uh, the signature, I have the picture here of Tom Tyler just looking like a happy, nice person, and then I have a copy of his signature right underneath it. So I have about four Tom Tyler signatures I've purchased through the years, and I always match them up with this one to see if they're authentic, because this did come off a contract he'd signed with FBO that Mike Tyler actually had. So there's just a lot about Tom Tyler that I admire. Now, just to clear up some of the wrong information that's out there on the Internet, let's go rapid fire a little bit here. What was his childhood like? What kind of family did he come from? And where did he come from? Well, his father was an immigrant from Lithuania. 
And uh, Tom was born August 9th in 1903 in Port Henry, New York. He was the second of five children. And the family did move to Hamtramck in September of 1918, so Tom would be about 15 years old. And his father had heard that uh, there were better employment opportunities at this new Ford plant in the Detroit area. And he wanted to get out of the mining business, which was grueling and tough and uh, beat your body up. And, and Frank, his father, uh, moved the family to Hamtramck. And that's where Tom, actually from the age of, what, 15 to about, oh, 21 or so, that's where Tom lived uh, in Hamtramck. And I tried to find out what sports he actually participated in, but Ray Slupsky, his godson, didn't actually know. And Mike, his nephew out in California, was unsure of it. I've heard reports, and you have too, I'm sure, that I saw one movie a promotional piece that said he was a rodeo star mm -hmm. and he played football and wrestled and he was a, a, a merchant marine and all these things. None of that's true. There's no indication at all that he wrestled, and that's my area of expertise is wrestling. So I would have come across his name somewhere. Nat Pendleton, a name you may know, uh, was uh, an Olympic silver medalist in 1920 in wrestling and a big star at Columbia University, and I've written his biography, too. He went to Hollywood and made over 100 movies. Uh, nowhere have I come across Vincent Markowski or Tom Tyler's name as a wrestler. And if you watch him box a couple times or throw punches in, in his movies, he's stiff. There's no doubt in my mind he wasn't a boxer. Uh, what he was was a tremendous weightlifter. And I do have some evidence that he was an acrobat of some sort, that he could do things uh, on the steel rings and parallel bars. Uh, but to me, he was just a, a, a weightlifter with a tremendous physique and that innate desire to do something with his life. And that's a quality that I greatly admire. When he was a kid growing up, what was his dream? Did he want to be an actor? Well, I don't know if I can answer that because uh, there's no real evidence of that. Tom didn't mm -hmm. uh, write much that has survived. But uh, Ray Slepsky, whose mother, Catherine, was Tom Tyler's sister, they were really close. And when Tom first went out to Hollywood and established himself, Catherine actually came out there and stayed with him for five or six months uh, in his apartment, and as did Frank Jr., his older brother. And Frank Jr. came out there and actually ended up working in Hollywood as a gaffer and a, 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 a best boy and things like that for many, many years. And he actually changed his last name to Tyler because he would tell so many people he was Tom Tyler's brother, and they'd say, well, how come your, can't, your name's Markowski? And he got tired of explaining, so he just finally changed his name to Tyler, too. So he was known as, as Frank Tyler. And, of course, it's his son, Mike Tyler, who I just told you about, who lives in Apple Valley. By the way, Mike Tyler has an awesome Tom Tyler collection. Unbelievable. He has a great, big, gorgeous oil painting of him hanging in his uh, den that just will knock your socks off, one of a kind. But um, Ray Slepsky did say that his mother, Catherine, had told him that Vincent always just had a, a drive to be somebody. And she remembers that he liked going to movies when he was young, and he liked Tom Mix, and uh, he was very, very quiet and shy, but very driven, as proven by his exploits in the weight room. Uh, I don't know if you've ever lifted weights, but I've been doing it for 55 years. And one of the things I like about weightlifting is I tell everybody that I've gotten into weightlifting, my son's quite a weightlifter, and I say, you get exactly out of a weight room what you put into it. If you go in and sit on your cell phone and shoot the breeze and talk to people, come in, then do a set, take five minutes, then do another set, you're not going to get much out of it. But if you come in with the mindset, this is my opportunity to improve myself, to get stronger, to push myself to the limits, to test myself. And that's how I lift weights. Still at the age of 73, I lift weights as hard as anybody in the room. And I feel that's a bond between me and Tom Tyler, too, because there's no question Tom Tyler was a very dedicated weightlifter. And I think he took that same dedication and drive into the film world. I don't know, per se, if he was determined to be a movie actor from age 15 or 16, but again, Ray Slepsky says he remembers his mother telling him that her brother was very, very interested in the film world early on. How good was he at weightlifting? 
I heard at one point in time he was the best. Is that true? Oh, yes. Well, actually, weightlifting is what propelled him into Hollywood by a circuitous route. He actually, when he was a teenager, entered some kind of a strength contest in Hamtramck, and he went up on the stage and did some lifting and, and won some impromptu contest. And in the, in the stands, one of the spectators had some connection with Hollywood. And he went up to him afterwards and said, boy, you've got everything it takes to be a movie actor, and I've got some connections, and that kind of got the ball rolling. When he went out to Southern California, he won the Southern California Weightlifting Championships four years in a row. And that was equivalent to being a national champion because all the really good weightlifters were in two places, York, Pennsylvania, and Southern California. And uh, the York lifters would actually go out to the Southern California Open. And then he did win the nationals twice. He was two-time national weightlifting champion. Now, I'd read through the years uh, on typical stuff about Tom Tyler with people who don't understand weightlifting. They said he set a world record of 760 pounds. But they didn't explain what that meant. That's accumulation of three different lifts. The, the press, the overhead press, the snatch, and the clean and jerk. So I actually went to a friend and an authority at the University of Texas who has all the weightlifting records all through the decades and the, back into the 1890s. And they looked up Tom Tyler for me and found out exactly what his lifts were. And they're, they're tremendous for that age in that era. And in fact, he became the first American ever to lift 300 pounds in the clean and jerk. And that's where you squat over the bar, grab it, pull it up to your shoulders, catch your breath, mm -hmm. and then you can use your legs and hips to thrust it up arm's length overhead. He weighed about 195 when he did it. And again, to repeat myself, he is the first American ever to clean and jerk 300 pounds overhead. And that's a tremendous achievement. Especially this is, he's still working, he's just starting out on his Hollywood film career too. So Tom actually was, was chasing two incredible careers at the same time, trying to be a national weightlifting champion, which he accomplished, and be a movie actor, which he accomplished. And it's just, it's just amazing. And Herman Bricks, I wrote his biography called Please Don't Call Me Tarzan. And when I was talking to, I went out and spent six days with Bruce Bennett slash Herman Bricks in his home in Beverly Hills. I would get there at 10 o'clock in the morning, and he would be waiting for me, he and his houseman, and they would usher me into the den, and we'd sit there and go through Bruce's scrapbooks that he hadn't even looked at, he said, for 50 years. And one day we're sitting there, and I said, Bruce, did you ever meet Tom Tyler? And he looked up at me right away, and he said, how do you know about Tom Tyler? And I said, well, I'm a weightlifter, and he was too. And he said, yes, I made two movies with his wife, Jean Martell, and once Tom came to the movie set to see his wife, and we chatted briefly. And I said, do you, do you have any recollections of him, any impressions? And he said, yes, as a very nice, polite man, but very shy, very quiet. And I said, uh, do you know anything about his strength or anything like that? Now, this is Herman Bricks talking, who is silver medalist in the Olympics in the shot put. Right. And won six national titles in the shot put. He said to me, I think Tom Tyler was the strongest man in Hollywood for years. So I'm pretty proud of that statement in the book, uh, Mike. That's something I gleaned from an interview from Herman Bricks. And uh, to validate Tom's exploits and how strong he was, here we have a guy who played Tarzan and was incredibly strong himself, saying Tom Tyler was the strongest man in Hollywood. And that's coming from a very strong guy. Bruce Bennett slash Herman Bricks lifted up a car in Chapter 2 of Daredevils of the Red Circle. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, I think Herman Bricks was the greatest Tarzan ever. Uh, he mm -hmm. played... He played uh, Lord Greystoke or Tarzan exactly the way Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote him. Uh, I went to two Hollywood collector shows with my book, Please Don't Call Me Tarzan, mm -hmm. with Bruce Bennett sitting at my side. He was 86 years old. And we had the longest lines of any celebrity there other than Don Knotts, Barney Fife. Right. The line to get <laughs> Bruce's autograph was the entire length of the Beverly Garland ballroom. Mike Connors came over to meet him. Hugh O'Brien came over to meet him. Beverly Garland came over to meet him. Uh, Ed Burns came over to meet him. Uh, Lou Grant, uh, Ed Asner came over to meet him. And he was just this extremely dignified, wonderful human being. I actually went to his 100th birthday party in his home May 6th of 2006, and he died six months later. But uh, that, that, he's, he's my all-time favorite movie actor, Herman Bricks, Bruce Bennett. But Tom Tyler's right up there, too, I, and Nat Pendleton. And I love to research people.
people, Mike, and find out what they were like as people. Mm -hmm. And to repeat myself, if I find out they weren't really very nice people, uh, I lose interest quickly in writing their biography. But I thought Tom's story deserved to be uh, told and retold, so that's why I wrote the book. Who deserves the credit for discovering Tom as an actor? Well, that's a question, again, that I'm not sure I can answer directly. I, again, that I don't have the name in front of me. I could go back and look in the book, but the fellow who saw him on the stage in Hamtramck when he won the weightlifting contest, and then he went out and uh, he had a couple small roles in small movies, and then FBO looked him up or hooked him up, and he signed a contract at $75 a week. You know, when he first started out, Joseph Kennedy, of course, uh, the father of the 35th president of the United States, was running FBO at the time. His first role was in Gallup and Gallagher in 1925. Fred Thompson was a major Western star who had been working at FBO at the time, and he was unhappy with the salary Joe Kennedy was giving him, and so he, he left the studio, and uh, Joe Kennedy had the presence of mind when Tyler was brought to him, or Vincent was brought to him, to see the potential of this young stud, and they gave him a starring role. And I know Oliver Drake played a big role in his life. He became a, a screenwriter of, of some impact, but they used to share an apartment together and, and talk about what they wanted to be when their careers took off, and they remained friends all through uh, Tom's life. In fact, Oliver Drake actually stood up with him at his wedding when he married Jean Martel. So uh, I'm not sure I can pinpoint any one person who said that Tom Tyler was going to become a star, but it's Joseph Kennedy who certainly gave him the break. My favorite Tom Tyler movie is a movie from 1936 called The Phantom of the Range. Of the B-Westerns he made during his career, do you have a favorite? Yes, Silver Bullets is my favorite. Mm. Um, I really like Silver Bullets, and I talk about it quite a bit in the book, saying and, and he's, he's all dressed in a black outfit, wearing a black hat. He's riding a black horse. Um, it starts out with some good action scenes right off the bat. And if you look at Silver Bullets, just the way he moves and acts and, and presents himself, uh, I like the one you mentioned, too. I like some of the others, but... Is I, I've watched that movie four or five times, and I think, how could this guy not have been a Tom Mix or a Buck Jones? I mean, he had the same presence, uh, but for whatever reason, he, he, he was never able to climb to those heights. But Silver Bullets, th that's my favorite. B Westerns in general are low budget. That's where the B comes from. It stands for budget, and Tom Tyler's movies were very low budget. We're talking the definition of Poverty Row type films. For example, his movies, Lost Ranch and Orphan of Pecos, share the exact same movie poster. And Tom's movies were very different from the other B-Western movies of that same era. He doesn't have a sidekick who's brought in for comic relief, like Gabby Hayes or Smiley Burnett, or Fuzzy St. John, or Andy Devine, or Dub Taylor. He very rarely even has one. Most of the time he just works alongside the leading lady of the movie. He also isn't billed like the other stars from that era. There was Tom Mix with his wonder horse, Tony, or Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys, with Trigger, the smartest horse in the movies. Tom never had any of that. He didn't even use the same horse during his career. He had a lot of different horses. Ace, Baron, Boy, Flashlight, Red, and Silver Chief. Yes, Silver from the two Lone Ranger Republic serials and Raider in the Durango Kid movies. At one point in time was Tom Tyler's horse. So why didn't his movies follow the traditional B-Western formula. I think you've touched on something very, very important. Of course, the first movie Cowboy started to make a hero out of his horse was Tom Mix. Tony was called the Wonder Horse. You look back then, Tony was almost as big a star as Tom Mix. And I, I think 
it goes back to his agent and his representative, Mike. If I would have been Tom Tyler's agent, I would have had it written in the contract. He will have the same horse. It will look the same. Uh, even if one of them gets hurt, I want two horses looking exactly the same. And he will have the same name. We'll call him Silver or, or Tonto or anything. We're going to follow the formula of Tom Mix and Buck Jones and Ken Maynard, who all had their horses named. So you, the, the, the audience can relate to them as a team. It's Tom Mix and Tony. It's Gene Autry and Champion. It's Roy Rogers and Trigger. I think you've hit on something very key. And the other thing is, I would have called him Tom Tyler in the movie script. Make him a personality that the audience can look to and relate to instead of changing his name. You know, the Durango Kid was Steve in almost every movie. Right. But his last name would change. I mean, build a continuity with your audience. I think that's key. So I think you've touched on two really key components. In 1938, Victory Pictures replaced him with Tim McCoy, which raises the question, how popular was Tom Tyler? Because during this time, yes, Tim McCoy was the bigger name, but his career was on a downturn, why would they do that? Why would they replace a younger and more talented actor with someone who was past their prime? Here's a very interesting comment, too. You asked how big a star he really was. Uh, here's a comment from, let's see, Glenn Shirley in Old West Magazine. Tom's writing got better with every film, and his on-screen brawling came naturally eventually. The proof of his popularity could be found in the Ex Exhibitor's Herald publication of October 30th, 1926. The article listed the 60 best box office names and pictures according to questionnaires signed and returned by 2,471 exhibitors participating in the survey conducted by the studio section of the Herald. Exhibitors were asked, what names mean the most to you in your billing? The top 60 included Tom Tyler in spot number 34. Colleen Moore led the entire list with 278 points, while Tom Mix was second, just three points ahead of Fred Thompson. Harold Lloyd was fourth, followed by Hoop Gibson, Norma Talmadge, Mary Pickford, and Douglas Fairbanks. Tyler's 34th ranking placed him ahead of such established stars as Lillian Gish. So he came out of the shoot firing with both barrels. I mean, here's this guy who's got this chance, I think, to be a Gary Cooper. Somewhere along the line, he didn't have the right representation to take him to the next level. I think it's just that simple. Uh, he had everything you'd want in a movie star. He had presence, personality. He was easy to work with. Uh, he caused no problems for the directors or production bosses. He, he just, he had it. But later on, we can have, I can read you some quotes from people many years later analyzing his career saying, why didn't he make it? You have to go back to his agents and representatives. This guy had it all, but he wasn't handled correctly. Tom was married to Jeannie Martell, his co-star from three of his movies. How long did the marriage last? Why did it end? And was he romantic with anyone else? Well, that's a really either safely guarded part of his history or people just simply don't know much about it. Now, I, on page 47 of my book, I do say one of his co-stars said he had a torrid love affair with Marlene Dietrich, uh, which surprised me greatly and interested me because she was a major, major star and he was far less than that. But if you know a lot about Marlene Dietrich's background and history, you know that she was um, a woman who was very interested in conquering anybody she could. <laughs> and Tom Tyler probably had a lot of appeal to her once she saw that tremendous physique and what he looked like. Uh, that surprised me. I didn't know that he had a, re a relationship with Marlene Dietrich, but I've only found one source for it, and I did quote her. It's an actress who'd starred with Tom. And then he met uh, Jeannie Martel uh, back in 1937, I think, when they were working on a movie called The Lost Ranch. They made three movies together. Uh, they got married quickly. In 1937, he also went to work for the Wallace Brothers Circus, and he was touring. Tom Mix, you know, started that trend, and Gene Autry and Roy Rogers and Hoot Gibson, a lot of others followed in that vein to make a lot of extra money. 
uh, because they weren't making much. Uh, Tom Mix was, but his career was pretty well gone by then. And they were traveling a lot, and they were they were divorced within about four years. And I pointedly asked Ray Slepsky, once again his godson, who was the son of Tom's favorite sister. I actually have a picture of Gene Martell and Tom coming to the Slepsky household in Hamtramck right after they got married, and Tom's holding the infant uh, Ray Slepsky mm-hmm. in his hands, and it shows him a smiling, loving couple, Tom and Gene. And I asked Ray, I said, whatever happened, did you, do you you know anything? And he said, no, it was always never discussed in our household. Uh, mother didn't ever mention it, and I was too young to really ask. And he said, uh, I've never heard anybody talk about it. At one time, people were saying Jean Martell was the next Joan Crawford. She had that sultry look to her and was very attractive, and people thought she was going to be a major star. She only made six or seven movies herself and disappeared from the scene. Then I asked uh, Mike Tyler, again, who lives in Apple Valley, whose father was Frank Jr., Tom's older brother, what he knew about it. And I could tell he really didn't want to talk about it, uh, or he didn't know much about it. And he finally, after I pried a little bit, bit, he just shrugged and said, I just heard she uh, ran off with another man. But he said, I don't know that. Uh, He said, it's just something that I've heard. And he said, it was never really talked about in our family. So uh, I think that's just something we're going to have to chalk up to something we'll never really know. You know, he... He was he was just scraping by all these years. Tom Tyler was just scraping by, and Jean Martel may have gotten tired of that, you know, because she was just scraping by. So maybe she found somebody that had money, and so she could retire from the movie industry. I, I'm just speculating. I, I don't know any of that. I don't think we'll ever know because neither Tom or Jean, from what I've been able to find, uh, had children. And uh, all that's lost in the mists of time. There's only certain things we're ever going to know about anybody, including Tom Tyler. And I, and I think this book, The Tom Tyler Story from Cowboy Star to Superhero, does a good job of bringing together uh, everything that we're probably ever going to know about Tom. And again, Mike, the thing I'm proudest of is letting people know what the people who worked with him thought of him, what his um, heirs, not heirs, but what his... Uh, relatives thought of him, the kind of person he was, his incredible weightlifting exploits, and uh, scleroderma. I was on a big radio station in Des Moines, WHO Radio, one of mm-hmm. the biggest stations in the Midwest, talking about Tom Tyler and scleroderma about four years ago. The Scleroderma Foundation in Iowa was raising money, and somebody had told them about my book on Tom Tyler. And they bought some time on this big radio station, and they asked me to come on and talk about Tom Tyler and scleroderma, which I was pleased to do, of course. And again, it's a hideous disease, and Tom uh, didn't deserve that kind of a fate. Some people say Tom's big break came in 1939 when he played Luke Plummer in John Ford's Stagecoach. Some people say his big break came before that when he was a leading man making B-Westerns. And some people say his big break came after that when he played Captain Marvel in Adventures of Captain Marvel. What would you say was Tom Tyler's big break as an actor? No, his big break break would have come if he would have been cast as the Ringo Kid in that movie or if he would have been cast as Bill Hickok in The Plainsman or something like that. It was a small role. He doesn't even appear in the film till what, the last ten minutes. And uh, it's a memorable role. He, John Ford loved the way he acted after he... I, I've, I've read that that was Tom's interpretation to just let me stagger into the saloon that mm-hmm. way. And Ford loved it. But it's, it's, it's such a brief occasion... He never really had a big break. Everything was geared toward this role right now and putting money in his pocket, as far as I can tell. I don't think he had an agent who said, here's like Sylvester Stallone when he came up with the idea of Rocky and people wanted to buy the film from him but didn't want him to star in it. And Stallone said no, even though he was living in a small apartment in New York and was dead broke, he held out for the starring role in Rocky and got it, and we know what that did to his career. Uh, 
I don't see Tom ever had that kind of break. Now, you can say his big break was playing Captain Marvel in 1941 because it was popular. And he did a terrific job, and he looked great on screen. But it was a serial, and uh, serial actors were looked down upon. It, some co some actors even had it in their contract with a studio that they don't have to act in serials because uh, they thought it was a killer for their career. And, and Herman Bricks felt that the serials he'd been in early on uh, really typecast him, and that's why he changed his name to Bruce Bennett and disappeared for a year and came back as uh, with a whole different persona as a character actor. And, you know, he played Geronimo even in, in a movie with Lucille Ball at one point. Um in 1942. So I don't think Tom ever had a big break other than right at the beginning when, as a young whippersnapper who just arrived from Michigan, FBO signs him to star in, in his first movie. That was his big break, and he needed an agent to guide him through the maze of Hollywood. Now, I've got two scripts out in Hollywood right now. Uh, one's called Lowell Park, and it's about Ronald Reagan as a lifeguard in 1932. You know, he's a lifeguard for seven straight summers in Dixon. He saved uh, 77 people. It's all verified over seven years, pulled them out of the Rock River. I've got, that's been out there. All kinds of producers have looked at it. We've been close to having a, a signed deal numerous times. And then I've written a script called The Grappler, uh, set in 1905, starring Randy Couture, who's a good friend of mine. Randy, as you know, was UFC mm -hmm. champion and is an absolute legend and has made 13 movies, all three Expendables with Sylvester Stallone. Mm -hmm. Randy and I and our agents actually pitched it on the lot of a major studio uh, two years ago, and the producer followed us out onto the street, couldn't quit talking about it and saying, we're going to make this movie, we're going to make this movie. That's been two and a half years ago, Mike. Uh, the point of the of the stories is you're at the mercy of other people who pull the strings and if tom didn't have the right people behind the scenes fighting for him for a role that would make him a john wayne like stagecoach or a gary cooper or anybody or a sylvester stallone then you're left to the mercies of the studio and fickle fate and uh, tom just never in my estimation had the right people pulling for him he was, he was a person who went to work every day. He learned that from his dad. Show up, do your job, go home with a smile on your face, and wait for the next offer. And if you don't have people out there pushing the, the agenda to make, you, to make your project go or make you go, then lightning just has to strike. You just have to be incredibly lucky. And he wasn't incredibly lucky. He was lucky enough to get out there and get a few a few roles that got him started in the industry, but he wasn't lucky enough to have the next big push. Um, John Wayne hung out with John Ford for two years, mm -hmm. uh, playing cards, drinking whiskey, and sailing with him on his yacht. And Ford finally decided to cast him as the Ringo Kid. Uh, did Tom Tyler hang out with John Ford and people like that? He hung out with Oliver Drake, but Drake didn't have that kind of power. So uh, who, who knows, Mike? Uh, he had a great career. People like you and I remember him and appreciate him, and I'm sure there's lots of others that do, although it's it's diminishing. All the people who cared about him uh, and really saw his films are fast disappearing. You're the exception to the rule. You're just a young fellow, and it'll be up to you to carry on the, the legacy of Tom Tyler after people like me and Bobby Copeland, who died last year, disappear. Some people look at Tom Tyler's career and they say, Oh, he's just some cowboy star, or he's just some superhero, but he's a real actor, and I disagree with you. His role in Stagecoach is bigger than you think. It's an amazing performance. His work in the silent movies really came in handy for this one. What he does in the saloon when we first see him is a silent movie performance in the sound era. And this movie made me realize he has this ability that very few actors have where they can play the hero just as good as they can play the villain. Gene Autry has to be a good guy. Roy Barcroft has to be a bad guy. Or it just feels wrong. Tom can be very likable and make you want to cheer for him when he's the good guy. And he can be very sinister and make you want to cheer against him when he's the bad guy. 
So would you say that's his gift as an actor, his versatility and his ability to play both sides so well? I think that's a great point and one that's often overlooked. Jack Elam, of course, is another one like that fits into that classic mm-hmm. mold. How could he be anything other than a villain? And Lee, Lee Van Cleef mm-hmm. is one of the few ones who was able to make the transition from villain to hero in some of his films. But you're right. Tom Tyler, which addresses his skills as an actor, uh, can you know he was in Powder Smoke Range where he played a villain. That might be the first time. And then he did a, a wonderful job as a villain in Stagecoach, of course, playing Luke Plummer. But you're right, Mike. Uh, he was an actor, and actors act. And so he could act the role of a hero, which I think he was naturally suited toward by his personality and his persona, but he could also p- play uh, a, a, a terrific villain as he did in Stagecoach. So, uh, again, I'm, I'm being repetitive, but I just don't think he had the right person or mm-hmm. people uh, directing his career. There's, he should have had an agent pounding the streets, going behind the scenes, when he heard a, a movie role was up, and going in there and saying, hey, my guy's perfect for this. Tom Tyler's your guy. And uh, I, I don't think that happened from what, I, from what I could discern. I don't think that happened. He did have it. He had the it factor. And he was genetically blessed. He was tall, trim, good-looking, very good-looking. So what's missing? Well, what's missing is he didn't have the right people pushing nice. him. <laughs> you know, here's... And when you read some of the comments about people who spent their life studying Western film, a lot of them are surprised that he wasn't a much bigger star. And they they point their finger at two things, that he probably didn't have good agent representation, and that a lot of the studios he worked for were just cranking out these cheapies. At one point in FBO, uh, they say the budgets were between eight and 10000 for a movie, and they were shot in between four and five days. Can you imagine that? And and I think Tom was just pleased to be out there, pleased to be working, was counting on his agents to direct his career in a way that would make him like a Gary Cooper or a John Wayne, but that break just never came. So I, I admire his tenacity and his drive and discipline. If you know who Chuck Anderson is, he's got the old Corral website. Sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, here's a quote. He says, though Tom was tall, muscular, and looked downright impressive, he was often often saddled with slip-shot efforts at syndicate, monogram, reliable, and victory. Included were ac- uh, anemic production values, lack of directorial finesse, shoestring budgets, and inane scripts. Tyler often appeared stiff and ill at ease, mouthing the oftentimes incredulous dialogue. However, when given better material, such as Captain Marvel the Phantom and the Three Musketeers features, Tom's overall performance was enjoyable and above par. But perhaps his real calling was gunfighter roles, such as Powder Smoke Rings and Stagecoach, for his penetrating stare and sinister mannerisms brought instant hisses and critical acclaim. Um, it says, Bob Steele is remembered today, along with the likes of Buck Jones, Tom Mix, and other big names, yet Tom Tyler seems to have been forgotten. He deserves better for his 90-plus Western starring roles, representing both extremes of the B-Western spectrum, from the poverty role odors at the various studios to the quality and polish of Republic. Thankfully, much of his work is still aired on cable and available on video. Okay. Tom Tyler was a talented workhorse who brought some real excitement to those wonderful Saturday matinees. And you and I, I think, would certainly uh, concur with that. He has a few ties to John Wayne. He made several movies with the Duke. In Stagecoach, Wayne played the Ringo Kid. In 1950, in a Tim Holt movie called Riders of the Range, Tom plays a villain called the Ringo Kid. And in the Three Musketeers series, John Wayne played Stony Brook. Then, several years later, Tom played Stony Brook in 13 films. So, was he friends with Wayne or any of the other stars that he worked with during his career? Who were his friends? I don't don't think he was friends with them. I think... They certainly knew who Tom was, and they respected him, and we'll talk about Gene Autry's respect for him here shortly, too, and what a great role Gene Autry played in Tom's final years. 
but I want to go back to what you just said about Tim Holt. I'm sitting here in Newton, Iowa, about three months ago, watching the Western Channel, and on comes that movie. And I didn't even know uh, Tom Tyler was in it. And I have a filmography at the end of my book that um, I used by permission from um, one of the most recognized Western film authorities there is, and that movie isn't listed. So I'm sitting there watching it. I'm amazed um, at his performance in it. But that was in 1950, as you said, Mike, and I can see the beginnings of scleroderma Mm -hmm. in his face. Right. I can see his face is starting to get drawn and tight, and watching that was very painful for me emotionally because uh, I had not been aware of that. I actually met Tim Holt briefly when I was 10 years old. Tim Holt's one of my favorite movie actors, and I actually have a signed picture of Bruce Bennett and Tim Holt from Treasure of the Sierra Madre sitting right in front of me. And uh, so there's two of my favorite actors, Tim Holt and Bruce Bennett, together. But back to the Tom Tyler movie, I hadn't even known he was in that movie, Mike, and I'm sitting there watching him in that role. And yes, he's a bad guy in the role. And I felt really bad. I thought, here's this guy who had the guts to go all the way out to Hollywood when he was 22 years old and carved out such a niche for himself. And here he is, stricken with scleroderma. He's going to be dead in four years, and he's reduced to this kind of a role. But he had his moment. Uh, Tom Tyler sure had his moment, and uh, he didn't have a very glorious ending, that's for sure. Most people would say Tom's greatest role is playing Captain Marvel in Adventures of Captain Marvel. Now, I think his greatest role is when he played the Phantom in the 1939 serial of the same name. Tom was born to play this part. He looks great. As the Phantom, he looks like he just jumped off the page of a Lee Falk comic strip, and he delivers a very strong performance. Tom does a great job as Captain Marvel, but he doesn't have a lot to work with because he has to share the spotlight with Frank Coughlin Jr., who played Billy Batson in that serial. Now, just to be clear, I do think... Adventures of Captain Marvel is the superior serial because it has a better storyline, it's more entertaining, and it was made by Republic, and Republic serials are the best. I don't really like any of the serials that were made by Columbia, except for The Shadow, Deadwood Dick, and obviously The Phantom. Now, obviously Tom's best known for playing Captain Marvel but what do you think is his best role? I would agree with you. And at the Tarzan convention, uh, a person came up to me and he saw the Tom Tyler book sitting there and he already owned it. And he's a college professor, retired, and the Phantom is his all-time favorite character by far. Mm-hmm. And he said to me, I loved your book on Tom Tyler. Thank you so much for writing it and all the pictures you have in there of him as the Phantom. And he also likes the Billy Zane version of the Phantom, which I truly, truly like. And several people gathered around then in my table, and we were all talking about Tom Tyler. And all of them thought he would have been a good Tarzan. Uh, But I think all of them really respected him as his role in both Captain Marvel and the Phantom. But if I had to pick between the two of them, and I have... a. I have a whole wall in my house dedicated to Captain Marvel. He's my favorite costume character that flies. I use that caveat. Um, I I, I would go with the Phantom, but it's close. I really like him in the Captain Marvel role, although he doesn't get to say much. But I, I really, I like him. He just looks, like you said, he looks like he was made to play the Phantom. Like he stepped right out of the pages, uh, onto the, onto the movie screen. That's how I remember him, and I have the Phantom statue here, as I've told you, staring me in the face right now as I'm talking to you with his gun pointed at me, and it's made in the image of Tom Tyler. So, And that sits right next to the Tom Tyler biography on a rack that I have, and that wall is dedicated to Western film stars. I have original lobby cards of Tom Mix, Lash LaRue, Monty Hale, the Durango Kid, Tim Holt, and Bob Baker, by the way, who's 
from Iowa. I've done a lot of research on Bob Baker. His real name is Leland Stanley Weed. And up in the corner, I have The Trail of Robin Hood, a Roy Rogers movie that has Roy Rogers, Rocky Lane, mm -hmm. and Tex, not Tex Ritter, Monty Hale up mm -hmm. front. And Rex Allen and Tom Tyler are in that, too. So, golly, I, I appreciate Roy Rogers, just like I did Gene Autry, using uh, Tom Tyler in, in that movie. And you can see his face is real tight in that, too, Mike. It's already tightened up on him. I did talk to Monty Hale. I tried to get a hold of Monty Hale. But I did talk to his wife, uh, and Monty was in very ill health. And she got a quote from Monty Hale for me saying, what a gentleman he was, and I really enjoyed meeting him and uh, really enjoyed that very limited experience being with Tom Tyler. So, in Clayton Moore, who I know you know a lot mm -hmm. about, I talked to uh, a nurse who was Ray Slepsky's uh, sister, who actually was attending to Clayton Moore in a hospital near the end of his death, and she said that she was related to Tom Tyler, and she said Clayton Moore said, oh my gosh, there was a true professional, mm -hmm. somebody who loved the profession, just a really, really nice man, a real gentleman. And so that's the theme I keep hearing over and over and over mm -hmm. from every source. I haven't read one source or talked to one person who said, Ew, I didn't really care for Tom Tyler. And that, that means a lot to me. When did Tom first start having issues with his health? And the reason I ask is because the first time I had ever officially seen Tom in anything was in Adventures of Captain Marvel. I say officially because it was actually the second time I saw him. Because the first time I had really ever seen him in anything was in an episode of The Lone Ranger called Damsels in Distress. He plays a bad guy in that episode. And like you with that one Tim Holt movie... I also didn't know it was him. This episode is from 1950, and The Adventures of Captain Marvel came out in 1941, so in just nine years, he completely lost his looks, and his health was failing, so how did this happen? When did he first start having health problems? Well, I, t I talked to Ray Slepsky uh, about that, too, and Tom came home to live with that family, in uh, the Slepsky family in 1952, and at the end of 1952. And Ray says that his mother, Catherine, again, who was Tom's sister, prepared him. He said, your Uncle Tom's coming to stay with us, and he really looks different, and uh, he's really struggling, uh, but uh, it's, he's your Uncle Tom, and he's the same man who was a movie actor and was so generous to all of us. And Ray says, I can remember him at our first meal, he loved corn on the cob, and I can remember him trying to pick up the cob with his gnarled fingers, and what a tough time he had just holding the corn cob up to his mouth and with his fingers all gnarled and bent. And uh, it was a very emotional moment listening to Ray talk about him and how he shuffled around the house walking. He liked to sit out on the front porch in nice summer days and just gaze out across the street. And he said young uh, he, uh, people would come up when they found out that this was Tom Tyler and talk to him about his Hollywood days. But Ray said, I was too young to really absorb most much of it. Mm -hmm. And I wish I had because he loved to talk and he was very charming and he was great, graceful to everybody. To answer your question, I think it started to surface around 1949. And, uh, you know, Gene Autry was really, really wonderful to him. If you remember the part in my book where I quote about Gene Autry, let me read a little part of the book. This career in tatters due to illness, Tom had few resources in California to fall back upon. Gene Autry, who had posed for photos with Tom during his Captain Marvel mm -hmm. days, was one of the few who knew of Tom's situation and tried to help. Quote, I had the extreme good fortune to work with Tom in two Gene Autry TV shows, said veteran actor Bill Kennedy. We all knew that Tom was terminal and that Gene had hired him as a tribute. We loved Gene for this gesture. Tom gave a superlative performance in both segments. We spent a week with Tom, and I got to talk to him about his fascinating career. He knew Douglas Fairbanks, Valentino, John Gilbert, Tom Mix, William S. Hart, Chaplin. John Ford liked him, as well as many other famous directors of that time. 
as a result of the Autry stints. Tom had enough money to go back to Hamtramck and style to his sister's house, where he died with dignity and respect. And uh, Gene Autry, I've read his biography. I've read about four biographies of him. And, uh, of course, Gene had a drinking problem, but Gene was always eager to help old movie actors who were struggling. And uh, I, I have great admiration for Gene Autry and the things he did with his wealth. And I was pleased to, when I was a kid in Waterloo in 1953, Gene Autry's rodeo came to Waterloo. And I still can remember the excitement I felt when I saw Gene Autry right out of the tunnel under the spotlight on Champion. So, and to find out that Gene helped Tom. And in my book, and maybe you've seen them elsewhere, I have those two magnificent pictures of Gene Autry with Tom, and mm-hmm. Tom's in his Captain right. Marvel uniform. Yes. And yes. it's striking how much larger Tom is than Gene. He's really looking down at him. Uh, although I knew Gene wasn't a big man. But what, it, it, that was part of my goal in writing this book, Mike. And when the book first came out, we got a lot of praise. And, and one critic out in the East somewhere wrote something that said the book doesn't really tell anything new about Tom's career, and he's the authors just pulled together a lot of stories that we already knew. Well, the purpose of writing a book is to pull a, together a lot of stories so they're all under one cover, so you don't have to go to 30 different sources. Mm-hmm. So, of course, I'm going to quote from sources that people might have seen before, right? Uh, because that's what you do when you tell the story of somebody in a biography. But I broke all kinds of new ground in, uh, in terms of interviewing Ray Slepsky about his return home, uh, what it was like to see his uncle come home in that situation. I broke new ground with his uh, nephew out in California, who was the son of his older brother, Frank Tyler. I broke new ground with uh, his weightlifting exploits. Uh, I contacted experts who broke down his weightlifting exploits so that you don't just read, how oh, he lifted 760 pounds for a new world record. Well, what does that mean? How did he lift 760 pounds? Nobody can lift that much in one lift. Mm-hmm. So I broke that down. And, but most of all, I'm pleased that I uh, let people know about scleroderma because um, it's, it's, as I've said several times, a horrific disease. And it's, it's, it's rare, and it usually strikes females. So that Tom Tyler got this rare disease that strikes 80% of females is just another ironic twist in his uh, incredible story. One of the most poignant moments of all my research was Ray Slepsky. I asked him, do you know where Tom Tyler's grave is mm-hmm. in the cemetery he's buried in, in Hamtramck? And he said, yes, I do. And Ray and his wife and my wife, Beverly, and I got and drove to the cemetery and found the gravestone. It's pictured in the book. And it was all moss-covered and weed-covered. And uh, those two women, Tom Tyler's godson's wife and my wife, who was writing his biography, got down on their hands and knees and spent about 20 minutes clearing, uh, cleaning up his gravestone. And Ray said, we'll continue to do this, Mike, as the years go by. So uh, I thought that was really nice. Tom Tyler's story is a very sad one. It's unfortunate because he was a great actor and a great guy, but the facts are the facts. Poor health first took his career, then his life. He never got the recognition he deserved. He never got in with the right people, so he never became a big star. He didn't really make any money during his career. He's like one of those great old painters because he's been dead for over 60 years, but his work is more appreciated now than it was when it was new. And he was born at the wrong time. If his career had started today, he'd be one of the biggest names in Hollywood because superheroes have taken over movies and TV. Back in Tom's era, superheroes were regarded as kid stuff or junk. Now they're very popular and accepted by all. So he dies young, he never got that big break, and he died penniless. So would you say Tom's story is one of the great Hollywood tragedies? Can his story be put into that category? Well, yes and no. I've written a book called Triumph and Tragedy about four Iowa football players who are all Americans and legends. 
two of them died in war at the age of 24 and 22. Uh, another one uh, died at the age of 53 on the operating table for a knee injury. And an, an, another one died during a football game of a freak injury at age 22. So Tom lived to be 54, almost 54. Um, is his life tragic, the end? Yes. Uh, if you look at his overall life, 54 years, 50 of it were lived, uh, living an American dream, being a Hollywood star, not a major star, but a star. Um, he's been gone for 70 years, and yet you hear, hear you and I are talking about him with great affection and respect. So the ending was tragic. Um, he's up there with Marilyn Monroe and John Belushi, I suppose, who had tragic ends. Uh, but this wasn't of his own doing, of course. So that makes it even more tragic. He was, he was innocent. Uh, he had a genetical defect of some sort that allowed him to get this horrific mm -hmm. disease. Or somehow they they don't think it's transmitted a disease. Who knows? They don't still don't know what causes scleroderma, uh, which means tightening of the skin and your organs tighten up and you can't breathe. He would have had a horrific final uh, several days as his lungs tightened up and he fought for every breath. And he the, the descriptive cause is heart attack, but brought on by acute scleroderma. So I guess we have to define tragedy. The first 50 years certainly weren't a tragedy. The last four were certainly uh, very unpleasant for him, and the last year would have been a tragedy. So, yeah, it's, it's one of the great stories in Hollywood of a tragic early death. Gary Cooper uh, had one, too, and Lou Gehrig, who he portrayed magnificently, uh, once told the stadium at the, uh, the crowd at Yankee Stadium, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth even though he's dying of what became known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Mm -hmm. So I guess we have to define tragedy. He didn't go off to war and get blown to bits or suffer in a prisoner of war camp. But, yeah, it's one of the great unreported stories in early days of Hollywood, I would say. Buck Jones died in the Coconut Grove fire in Boston, you know, at a, at a young age. There's different reports there. Some say he was out and went in three times to help others out. Uh, which just sounds very heroic, and others say that's not true. He didn't even get off the balcony. They found his charred body up on the balcony. So who knows uh, what fate lies in store for all of us. What's Tom Tyler's legacy? Tom Tyler's legacy is probably wrapped up in Captain Marvel and the Phantom, uh, and to a lesser degree, his Western films. And his legacy is, to me... Think of the courage it took to get in a car and work your way out to California at the age of 21, stopping in Denver, almost destitute, and doing whatever it took to survive in a young Hollywood during the roaring 20s and, and making it. At the age of 23, he's starring in movies after growing up in Hamtramck, Michigan, of all places. So his legacy to me is somebody who aspired to big things, was willing to work incredibly hard at both his chosen career of acting and weightlifting, which I greatly admire, and, and making it. He made it. Did he make it all the way to the top? Was he a Cary Grant or a Clark Gable or a John Wayne? No, but he made it. So his legacy is somebody who worked very hard, had the courage to follow his dream, and left an impression on people like you and me. Mike, real quick before I let you go, plug your work. Where can people go to buy your books, and what are you working on right now? Well, thank you. Um, I, I did just write the, the story of Iowa's governor, Terry Branstad, who's the longest-serving governor in American history. And uh, he and I have known each other for a long time, and a group hired me to write his biography when he broke the all-time record a year ago. And now he's the ambassador to China, President Trump named him ambassador to China, and a Chinese firm has bought the rights to my biography and just reprinted it in Chinese. They just had a big debut for the book in Chinese in Beijing about a month ago, Mike, so I'm kind of proud of that. A book I've written has just been <laughs> reprinted in Chinese. Also, I wrote my memoirs called A Journey, Reflections on 50 years of writing, wrestling, weightlifting, and heroes. 
and I talk about all the people I've met in 50 years of journalism. Uh, I met Ronald Reagan face to face. I was executive editor in Dixon, Illinois, in his hometown in 1990. He came back, and I was one of 20 people that spent some time with him. Uh, I spent two days with Muhammad Ali as his escort when he came to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, in 1985, because I was chosen to be his escort. And let me say, he was he was wonderful to work with. Never turned anybody down. Uh, got on the floor on his hands and knees and played a card game with a bunch of children. Uh, it was just a joy to be around. Uh, that's in my book. I've known four movie Tarzans really well. Herman Bricks, Jock Mahoney, who also played the Range Rider on TV and is from Iowa, uh, Gordon Scott, and probably most of all, Denny Miller, who played Tarzan in 1959 and starred on Wagon Train for four years as Duke Shannon. Denny and I became very good friends, and I helped him with two of his books that he's written. And uh, we lost Denny two years ago, sadly, to Lou Gehrig's disease. Lots of pictures of me with Tarzans in the book, with uh, a lot of wrestlers I've known, from Dan Gable to Dan Hodge to Dan Severn, the UFC champion, to Randy Couture. Uh, some memories of growing up in Waterloo in the 1950s, where I talk about Tom Tyler and what he meant to me, and Steve Reeves, who I met briefly, and people like that. So the book's a reflection, Mike, on what life was like in America in the 50s with little dotted uh, small movie theaters that you could go to for 15 to 20 cents and sit there all day and watch Hopalong Cassidy and Bob Baker and the Durango Kid right across the screen. I don't recall seeing a Tom Tyler movie then. I saw Tom Tyler movies on my TV set in the early 50s. And all my experiences with wrestling, weightlifting, and that. And uh, now I'm working on a book uh, called Reno 1910, which is about the greatest heavyweight boxing match of all time between Jack Johnson, the first black champion, and Jim Jeffries, the undefeated white champion who they brought out of retirement because Jack London coined the phrase the Great White Hope. And what happened to Reno when that town swelled from like 30 people to like 65 to 70,000 people and every major boxing and wrestling aficionado was there as long with every con man west of the Mississippi and every prostitute in the area and Jack London and Rex Beach and the Marcus of Queensbury and reporters from all over. Wyatt Earp was scheduled to come but didn't come, but Bat Masterson was there and there's a rumor that, the son, that Butch Cassidy was there that he didn't really get killed in Columbia, so Pinkertons were there. It's just an incredible story, and I tell it from the perspective of Bat Masterson, who, as you know, after he left the Old West, uh, was a sports writer in New York City for like the last 15 years of his life, and he was there covering the fight. So I'm working on that. I've been to Reno twice to do research at the Reno Historical Society, and uh, I give speeches all over the state of Iowa, and I'm still working with Hollywood people trying to get those two movies made, Lowell Park and The Grappler, starring Randy Couture. So people can go to my website, www.mike-chapman.com, and see everything I've been up to. I did write a novel about Achilles, and it came out the same time as the movie Troy with Brad Pitt in 2004. There's, a picture, there's pictures on my website of me with Ronald Reagan, Lou Fez, the legendary world heavyweight champion, Lou Ferrigno, the Incredible Hulk, Muhammad Ali, and of me standing on the tomb of Achilles on the other side of the world, on the battle site of ancient Troy. So I'm really interested in history of all kinds, as you can tell. Uh, Tom Tyler was somebody who, who touched me, and I wrote the book and did a lot of research, and I'm proud of it. But I haven't really given him a lot of thought in the last 10 to 12 years. So this was very uh, uh, interesting, Mike, to talk to you about him, and I thank you for having the opportunity to do so. Mike, this was great. I really enjoyed talking to you today about a guy who I really enjoy watching, so thank you for taking the time to talk. I really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate what you do, Mike, and as I told you in an email, I'm impressed that a young man like you cares enough to keep these kind of stories alive, and, and I mean that sincerely. If it wasn't for people like you, uh, nobody in, in the coming years will know anything about Tom Tyler. And he deserved, the last line of, in my book is, he lived a life worth knowing, and uh, it's worth repeating for other people to know about. And we only printed up 2,000 copies of the book. They're all gone. I have about five left myself. I see them 
on eBay from time to time. But uh, they say four to five people probably read a book. And so if we printed 2,000 of them, Mike, and there's 2,000 of them out there, and four to five people are, have read it, that means you know, eight to 10,000 people know more about Tom Tyler than they did before the book came out. And so I'm proud of that.